Hi, everybody. It's great to see you. We have a really special program today. We are working with Michelle Muska from Oliso Irons, and she's going to have a special discount code for you if you're in the market for an iron. But she has put together a wonderful panel of cosplay artists, including Casey Renee, Michael Burson, and Janelle Santner. And what they are doing is amazing. It's the same tools, the same materials that you're all familiar with from your own making, but look at what they're doing with it. So Michelle, why don't you introduce our wonderful panelists? Hi, everybody. Thank you, Martha. And thank you for all of you joining us today. Um, I'd like to give a very warm welcome to our panel. It, it's been an absolute um, honor and pleasure to work with each of our talented panelists over the past few years. Um, I admire not only their artistry as well as their technical skill, but their, the passion that they have for their art. And I think most importantly, which um, really is close to my heart, is their willingness in sharing what they do with others and how to create um, their costumes. Um, I'd like to thank each of you today for taking the time um, to be on our panel, but also I know you spent a lot of time on your presentations and I really, we all really appreciate that. Um, Casey, Renee, Janelle, and Michael do approach what they do very differently, um, but they all use similar um, substrates and materials. And I think you'll find each of them um, really exciting to watch and see what they do. Uh, so I, I have a um, short little um, intro for each of them. I didn't want to really miss anything. Casey Renee is an award-winning cosplayer. She's the author of Cosplay Foundations and a costume educator. Casey enjoys supporting the community through judging cosplay contests, which if you ever get to go see one is really amazing. I went about 12 years ago and was blown away. Um, she does in-person hands-on classes. Tutorials are also available on her YouTube channel. And she's really excited to share some of her work with you today. And then we have Janelle. Janelle is a cosplayer who utilizes upcycled and thrifted materials, which I know um, is a big topic these days. And she has a passion for discovering new techniques. She works as a freelance fabricator for advertising, as well as a fabric cutter at a medieval garment shop called, a workshop called Fell and Fair. So I'm sure that would be a really fun activity, uh, uh, place to go. And then we will also um, have Michael Burson, who is a self-taught cosplayer with seven years experience in recreating costumes and designing fashion pieces, um, including winning the Her Universe Fashion Show at the San Diego Comic-Con in 2022. And in his talk today, um, which is called, It's All in the Details, Turning the Ordinary into Extraordinary. He will discuss how cosplayers adapt paint and weather fabrics to recreate the details of what a movie studio quality costume looks like, but on a cosplayer budget. Um, I always uh, has been one of the things that I've done as a maker my whole life. I say you can take nothing and make it into something. And that's what they do. Uh, they do such an amazing job. So I would really like to just um, get on with our presentation. And I think Casey is up first, Casey Renee. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that introduction. Uh, hello, friends. I am Casey Renee, and today we're going to talk about making touch-worthy costumes. So something that we as cosplay artists have to consider is how is something going to look on the internet? A lot of what we do takes up space on social media, like on our cell phone with Instagram, but also in spaces like YouTube and places like that. And so 
how do we take a costume and make it look touchable and actually develop texture to the point where we can, um, you can visually see it in a photo on your screen, which isn't a, like, you don't get a lot of space on that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about texture and then also some of my techniques that I like to use in recreating a few of my favorite costumes. The first one we'll talk about is the corpse bride. So in the center, you can see that this is kind of the artwork. It is uh, an animation. It's kind of stop motion um, and it is uh, more of a, of a darker animated character. And so how do I not only bring this to life and make it colorful and bright and, and really pop on a screen, but how do I recreate some of these pieces like her arm or the ribs, um, some of the weathering techniques? Something that I personally love to do is layer fabric. So if you can see the bodice is super textured. So I use obviously a bridal satin for most of this. It is a wedding gown, but I also decided to pair it with a lace fabric and the lace basically helps add a little bit more depth to the costume and some texture. I did this by actually flatlining each individual piece together. So my entire fashion layer is flatlined prior to actually sewing it to my cotill layer. And cotill is a material used in corsetry. I knew that I wanted my bodice to actually act as a corset on top of being something functional and beautiful on the outside. And then I used paint. I actually mixed just your basic acrylic paint with a fabric medium. And what the fabric medium will do is it'll actually allow your uh, fa your fabric to, your paint to move with your fabric. Um, so it kind of can stretch. It'll have like a stretchy capability. So it doesn't actually flake off uh, when you use it. I did the same technique to do the kind of like burnt or like damaged weathered look looking bits on the skirt. I love drama, so I added a bunch of drama. My skirt is 10 yards of fabric. Actually, technically it's 20 yards of fabric. It's 10 yards of a satin and another 10 yards of a cotton lining with horsehair braid. And I actually, to make all of the rips and tears in it, I did free motion quilting so that I could have the layers stick together and I could cut them, but they would stop fraying at a point. And that point allows my dress to not completely fall apart when I am actually wearing it. And then to kind of create like a more of a watercolor effect, I did water down my acrylic paint still with fabric medium in it. And then some other things that I personally like to do is add rhinestones. I really like the juxtaposition of something dark and macabre like a corpse bride and something sparkly and pretty like rhinestones and beadwork. So I personally made the choice to add tons of rhinestones to it. Um, the next piece I want to talk about is my TwitchCon award-winning costume. This was from the 2018 TwitchCon cosplay contest um, where I took the best in show. This costume took almost 800 hours to make. There are 30 yards of fabric in it and something like 50,000 beads, rhinestone sequins. Um, this piece is like truly a labor of love. Um, to start out, it only has, I only have one image, one reference uh, of this whole costume. Something that us cosplayers sometimes have to combat is only one image. Or if you're in the historical costuming side, sometimes all you have is a painting. And so you kind of have to fill in the gaps on your own. Uh, so you can see um, the lining of my skirts. I did uh, these beautiful embroidered stars that I did onto organza. I did a technique called tambour embroidery. And then I transferred them onto the lining and you can kind of, you can barely see it in the costume unless I'm moving, but it is an aspect of the costume that is just as important as all of the elements you can see. Um, and for this in particular, it was really important for me to um, be able to have these stars pop and so I made them a little bit larger than the actual drawing that like the the that it is on the design like on the drawing um, because I wanted them to pop I knew if they were too small they might just kind of be washed away so I made them larger um, the next thing that I did with this fabric is um, I made kind of my own textile and by that I mean 
I knew that there were these beautiful like dots on this piece, but I didn't know what that was. So I decided to add beads and to do this, I did mark every inch of my fabric while it was flat. And then all of the, um, the blue dots ended up being rhinestones. So you can see in this picture here, I am literally just sitting at a table with a ruler marking one inch everywhere. And then as I was going through the piece, I would figure out, okay, where do I want the beads? And I got all of my beads laid out before then going through and rhinestoning the entire uh, piece. And that that's like a three layer skirt that I did that on. Um, also, uh, there aren't often patterns available that cosplayers can like use that will properly mimic what we're trying to create. So we often draft our own patterns. Um, this is my kind of pattern drafting process for the skirts. I did draft all the patterns myself. The only patterns that I didn't draft were for a pair of stays and the pocket penier. And for me personally, it makes a lot more sense to not reinvent the wheel. Like if there's already a pattern for it, why am I going to put myself through that? but there weren't patterns for like the rest of the gown. So I have basically a whole side mocked up to kind of get an idea of what, how much fabric am I going to need? Where is the fabric placement? Something that was really important to me was specifically the ruffle size, as weird as that sounds. I wanted to make sure that the ruffles didn't get lost, but also that they weren't taking up so much space that you don't get to see all of that work that I put into the fabric. So these are some of my fabric mock-ups, and then you can see the dress kind of come to life a little bit more. Um, and that is basically part of the skirt making process. And then um, my favorite part of this, well, my favorite part of the legs, but my second favorite part is this collar. And the reason that I, I, the collar like on the back, you can't see it. So you don't really know like how it sits or attaches. So that was kind of a fun engineering aspect for me is like, how do I make this collar? How do I make it fit into my shirt, like into my bodice, but also how do I keep it standing up so that it looks like glamorous when I wear it. Um, and then something else that I was really interested in was Elizabethan ruffs. So I did make um, like an Elizabethan style ruff for the black ruff that was inside it. And something that I always think about when you're looking at a picture, especially of like a finished costume, if you have too much white on white or too much black on black, you can't exactly see that there is a new texture or a new layer. So something that I really wanted to do was incorporate this gold and especially the gold trim, but specifically the gold um, at the edges of the rough to really make the rough stand out because I felt like when I just did the rough without any gold uh, thread, it really fell flat and you couldn't tell that it was a rough. You couldn't tell that it was actually a pleated piece of fabric. And it was really important to me that for that to actually stand out and look like it was, you know, pleated down how you would a rough. Um, for this collar in particular, I did end up using buckram and wire, and I did um, machine stitch a lot of the wire in, and then I went through and had to hand stitch any of the top stuff down because once the wire was encased in the fabric, you can't really see it. You can feel it, but you can't see it. And so I wanted to make sure that all of the details were just hand stitched on versus using my machine. Um, also with something like this particular costume, you have like a billion, uh, accessories. So I had like a necklace, I had, um, gloves, I had, I even had like bracelets and making each piece individual and making it its own kind of like artistic piece is really important to me. So while I couldn't really see what designs were on the gloves, I could tell that they were fingerless. Um, so I just kind of went to town and found the gold trims that I liked. And then I would add beads as highlights. Something that I like to do personally is use beadwork as a way to highlight or accentuate certain aspects. So for example, um, if I want it to be very noticeable that the my glove ends here so that my sleeve can start here, I'll add a little bit of trim just so you get that fine definition. Um, I also cast, I think like, 
200 resin gems for this costume. And it also lights up a fun little trick that I did behind all of the resin gems, the main resin gems, at least there's like these bows and behind them, they all light up. Uh, and that was a fun little trick that I was able to do because I made the gems um, like like dark enough to where you couldn't see there's a light behind it, but light still like opaque enough to where the light will shine through. Um, and these are the little bows that I was speaking of. And something I also do in my work, um, even if I'm like replicating a piece or if I'm doing my own kind of Disney princess style thing, I like to follow scene lines that will create an illusion. So for example, with this costume, I actually made the boots a little bit higher so that it made my legs look like six feet long. Um, and that's just something that I like to do is I really like to sell the illusion that I'm like, look like this this character so same with like emily from the corpse bride which was the costume i showed you before the placement of my slit is purposeful to make me look taller and how where my like hips sit are all purposeful so that it like makes my body look more distorted which is a fun little thing to play with when you do have like foundation garments and things like that Oop. and okay so now we'll talk about kind of creating texture with something that is supposed to be lightweight but weighs about 40 pounds. Um, right now I am currently working on Glinda's bubble dress from the musical Wicked. You can see my progress behind me in my timbre loom. Uh, this is a costume that I've been working on for a year, over a year and a half now. And this costume is inspired by clouds. Um, and specifically some of the design like aspects that are pulled from history are Dior's Venus gown from the 1950s, which is awesome. It's a beautiful reference for time and space, but it's obviously not like a replica. It's their own dress still. Um, but because of all of the sequins that are on this gown, it weighs a lot. Also, Glinda has to be able to sing high notes. She is um, attached to a bubble that comes in from the sky and she fights in this gown, all in the same gown. And she has to get out of it in 45 seconds. So how do you take a gown that's gonna weigh 40 pounds and make it look lightweight? And you do that through your material choice. So the choices that Broadway had are a uh, material called bobbin net, and then they also use an organza. And those are the exact materials that I'm using. Um, the skirts are all organza. There's uh, three organza layers, two crinoline layers, uh, crinoline the material, and then there's a cotton or organdy, which is another like stiffer material that's been around since like the 1830s, 1820s. And um, there is no hoop structure under it because this gown needs to float. Uh, and if you've ever watched a hoop skirt move, uh, it kind of like everything moves with it. But when you watch this gown move on stage, it kind of has a life of its own. And so that's another challenge that is posed is like layering something like this and uh, recreating something that needs to move in the way that it does, but while it's also like a third of your own body weight. Um, and this costume in particular is the only replica piece I've ever done. I don't typically lean towards replicating something to a T. Uh, and so that's a big challenge for this. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, sorry, my slides are, they're slowly loading. Don't know why they're taking so long, but that's basically it. I'm also using a technique called timbre embroidery. And to create this bodice right here, I actually had to, there we go. I had to layer cotill, um, spandex, uh, organza and the bobbin net. And the bobbin net is what is used on my loom right now to actually do the timbre embroidery technique. So that is all about using textiles and uh, creating texture with uh, with cosplay and making basically costumes that like when you look at it on a screen, you want to touch it. So that is about the projects that I've been working on. And now I'd love to introduce my lovely friend Janelle Santner to the the hangout. Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. Uh, all right. 
All right. Sorry. So my name is Janelle. Um, I also go by Seems Come True on Instagram and other platforms. Um, I want to talk to you about upcycle and thrifted cosplay. So I've been cosplaying for about five years now, so I'm still very much in the learning phase, but I have learned so much from the community, the um, other people who have been cosplaying far longer than me. I've used Casey Renee's tutorials on several things, um, but a little bit on me. So I have a background in computer animation, uh, but I quickly learned that I missed working with my hands. So I do fabrication for advertising. I'm also a fabric cutter at Felon Fair. Um, and while living in Atlanta, I started going to conventions and I absolutely fell in love with everything that people were doing. And especially in cosplay, I get to use so many different elements of my um, different skill sets. And I'm constantly learning of new techniques to use that I just, I find it really exciting. Um, so one of my favorite things to cosplay are illustrations by artists of alternate versions of characters. So on the right here, you see, um, this is Chihiro from Spirited Away as drawn by Hannah Alexander. Um, and using illustrations like this is really fantastic because you get to interpret the, the textures, the fabrics that you're using, um, basically everything. So the fabric for the skirt is um, upcycled curtain lining uh, that I dip dyed and then embroidered with floss and beads from my own stash. The entire chest piece is used by, is embroidered with beads from my own stash, as well as necklaces that I thrifted and took apart to get the larger, more elaborate beads. Um, all the trim and everything is beaded. I use the center bead that was from a single long strand necklace that I found. The shirt base that she is wearing, that I'm wearing, is an old pillowcase that I dip dyed and uh, patterned. So to dive even further into using thrifted materials and cosplay, I love to design my own versions of characters. So this is Sophie Hatter from Howl's Moving Castle. Um, there's a book version and a movie version of her. In the movie version, she is a less, much less magical girl. Uh, she is kind of a girl that falls into this magical situation, but in the book, she is actually a witch and she imbues different uh, fabrics and textiles with her emotions in magic. So I wanted to create a look that was a little bit more uh, magical and witch-like. And this also forced me to uh, use upside on different textiles like that because it was pre uh, during the pandemic. Um, so I basically used what I had on hand, what I could find in the few stores that were open. Um, so her dress base is actually old curtains that I wanted to elevate and add a little bit more texture to. Um, so I cut these strips, ironed them, used uh, a technique that I found on one, someone else's tutorial that I used a template to weave the pattern into like the bodice structure and the bottom hem of the dress. And it took this sort of flat looking textile that I upcycled and turned it into um, a really dimensional element on the costume. Not to mention because I wore this in, at Dragon Con in August, uh, it was much more breathable, especially in the chest, um, which made it more comfortable overall, as well as being more visually interesting. Um, the weaving also plays into her character design because she was a hat maker at first. So she would be familiar with weaving and different techniques like that. And of course, as a hat maker, she really needed a cool hat. So I wanted to make her her own witch hat that was unique and very magical looking. So I did that by using a thrifted sun hat. Sorry. I tore the top off and I built it up using um, floral wire that I got from my neighbor. And then uh, an important part for cosplay for me is community and building relationships with the people around you. And I ended up making friends with a couple of the managers at my local thrift shops. So when I come in, they're like, hey, we have some broken stuff in the back that you could have if you want. And part of that was these reefs that had, were covered in beautiful flowers, but they were broken, so they couldn't sell them. So that's where the flowers for this hat came from. Um, I love that cosplay and making things like this creates such a union of creativity and just people that you necessarily might not have made those connections with before. Um, another element of using upcycled materials that I love is diving a little deeper into the characters. So I added the um, embroidered flowers onto her apron based on the 
uh, visuals in the movie, but also I figured if she's living in a moving castle and she imbues magic into um, fabrics by sewing, she's going to need a travel sewing kit. So I used uh, scrap leather that I think I took from an old purse that I had and created this little uh, sewing kit that you can see here on the right. I also used all um, either thrifted or objects from my own stash to fill all of these elements. All these bottles were from a thrift store. These elements were um, actually candy containers that I upcycled into this uh, costume. So just the little elements add a lot of texture and interest and deepen the story of the cosplay. And also it encourages more interaction with people because they wanna see all the cool things that are on your belt. Um, so adding little fun story elements like that really adds a lot to cosplay. Um, another thing that I did a lot during um, 2020 was hiking. So whenever I'm out hiking, I was looking for cool supplies to incorporate into my costume. I found this branch, brought it home, cut off all the um, little bits on it, like the bark and everything, sanded it down. And then when I was coming home from one day, I saw my neighbor putting out a bunch of stuff for garbage pickup. And one of the those objects was this cinnamon broom. And so I went over to this lady who I hadn't really talked to very much. And I was like, hey, do you mind if I take that? Which turned into a whole conversation of, um, oh, what are you going to do with it? What's cosplay? All that. And so you form these connections by gathering these unusual supplies as well, which I think is really cool. Um, in addition to the broom and the uh, cinnamon broom, the beaded element, the spider web that's attached to the broom is made from the same set of beads that I used to embroider the bodice on Sophie or sorry, on Chihiro. Um, but yeah, all those little beads are upcycled from an old necklace that I found at the thrift store and took apart and had held on to for a long while until they found a purpose for them. Um, another little element to this outfit was Calcifer the Fire Demon. Um, so I made this little light up prop using old uh, Christmas ornament, uh, LED lights, organza, scrap organza that I had in my stash, cabochons from a different project um, and I mounted it onto a little wire frame so it looked like he was floating in my hand. Another uh, costume that I want to show you is Toph Beifang from Avatar The Last Airbender. A really common thing for cosplayers to use is formal gowns and thrifted large-scale uh, costume uh, dress dresses and fabric pieces. So basically this whole costume was made with upcycled materials except for the gold trim even the structure, the understructure for the cuffs was the understructure on the formal gown. Um, on top of using the fabric from this gown that I used specifically for this project, I also took off all the embellishments and all the extra things from the gown. I saved it for a future project. So you can use all different levels of thrifted garments for things like this. I think I even saved the zipper from this for some reason, <laughs> for future project, who knows. Um, another thing that cosplayers can do is we can make shoes. So for this character, she is blind, but she can see through her feet by feeling the vibrations of the ground. She kicks out the soles of her shoes so that she can feel the ground, but that's not really safe for walking around a convention in. Um, so you can pattern your own shoes by putting on a pair of shoes that are about the right size and shape, cover that in plastic wrap, um, to cover that in duct tape, and then draw on your patterns. You can do this for all different types of objects if you want to make custom patterns for different things. My grandmother actually used this pattern, this patterning technique to make outfits for her little goose statue. So all kinds of things. Um, this leather also came from that same pair of chaps. So that single pair of chaps that I got from a friend have come in handy for I think four or five different projects at this point. Um, and then I sealed off the bottom with vinyl to protect my feet while I was walking around conventions. Uh, wig styling is a necessary but also very complicated thing in cosplay uh, because it is technically a sculpture, a wearable piece of art that you need to wear in your head all day. It needs to be lightweight. So uh, unconventional materials, thrifted objects, scrap fabric is all utilized. This was made by covering my wig head in plastic wrap, putting on spray insulation foam that we used for our own house repairs. Um, I carved that down. I covered it in felt. And then I covered that felt with hair wefts that you can see down here on the bottom left, uh, covered in glue. So it created a nice smooth surface that was lightweight, comfortable to wear all day at a convention, um, but it also used up stuff from around my house. 
and was cheaper and more durable than if you were to try and create this all with hair. Basically, wig fibers are just thermoplastics, so you have to approach it like you're sculpting thermoplastics as opposed to sculpting with real hair. Um, the headband element for this cosplay was made with that same fabric, and I did find several metal versions of this headband online that I could have just bought. But again, diving deeper into the character, the character is disguised as a character from a nation that is mostly carnivores, meat eaters. So I was thinking like the majority of their accessories are probably leather, leather based, animal based. Um, and I was able to use all scraps and paints and notions that I had already in my house. So again, this was a great um, not have to buy anything kind of project. Uh, but it also gave me the opportunity to add like this flame decor that wasn't in the original design as you're able to add more elements and more little design things that otherwise you really couldn't have before. So between just these two products, I was able to save yards of fabric, broken decorations, jewelry, unused craft supplies, unloved garments from the landfill. Upload, upcycling and thrifting not only keeps spending low, it forces you to think a little bit deeper about the character and their story and how they would interact with their own world. Um, all those little detail, details also invite so much more conversation with people that you meet at conventions or in stores or uh, basically anywhere that you are gathering supplies from. Um, it's a great way to meet other people. Um, so I hope this has been educational and fun, and I would love to introduce you to an amazing cosplayer and designer, Michael Burson. Thank you so much, Janelle. I'm going to share my screen. Wonderful. All right. So name of my presentation is It's All in the Details, Turning the Ordinary into Extraordinary. My name is Michael Burson. Here is a collection of some of the stuff I make. Um, to talk of me is pretty much to talk of also my wife, Haley. Uh, so I'll also be featuring uh, some of pictures of her because we do everything together. Um, but who am I? Uh, so I go by the Wizard Taylor on all social medias. You can follow me uh, anywhere on there. Uh, I am not like a professional costume maker or anything. I'm a therapist. Um, I'm a licensed clinical mental health therapist, North Carolina, and a yoga instructor. That's kind of my second job. And then the cosplay stuff is like my, my passion and my hobby, my stuff that I love to do. Um, started cosplaying in 2016. Uh, my wife Haley and I started attending conventions to collect comic books and saw all the people dressed up like oh my gosh you get to do this this is like Halloween all year round this is so much fun we want to do it so we got into it um and so we've been cosplaying things uh Marvel Game of Thrones Lord of the Rings like all the nerdy stuff we just we just do everything it's, it's so much fun we see we have a joke that like we'll go to any movie and like oops uh, I'm gonna cosplay from that I can't like go see something uh, we just went to go see the Barbie movie last night like okay which ones are we gonna cosplay um it's kind of an addictive thing um and so this is a picture of my Doctor Strange um uh design that that I submitted for the Her Universe Fashion Show last year. Um, and it uh, won audience choice of this big dramatic cape that opened and, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so also creating like fashion pieces, uh, not just like the costume stuff, but also the uh, like things I get to wear uh, on a runway or just uh, going out to dinner. And so it's a lot of fun to, to make my own stuff. Um, so I really want to send home the message of what exactly cosplayers are able to do with the very limited resources that are available to us. Um, you've been hearing uh, from um, the two previous presentations, like just all this, all the skill sets that have to be developed by a single person to be able to try to either create something totally new or recreate something that we might see in the theaters. And so movie studios have, the people in there have years of professional training. They've been to art school, they have internships, they have dogs that bark down the hall at somebody. Um, cosplayers are often self-taught. Um, I'm completely self-taught. I, I don't have any formal training in anything. Um, movie studios have like next time you go to a marvel movie um basil is really excited about this presentation um they next time you go to a marvel movie and you're waiting for the post credit scene at the end of the movie um wait and look at the costume department and see just how many names are listed in there um they have teams of cutters and dyers and patterners and sewers and pleaters and fitters and stylists and shoemakers and embroiderers and pet wranglers animal control. 
and so much more. They have so many more resources. We are just working solo in our spaces. Um, or if you're like me and happen to have an awesome partner um, that we work together on stuff. Um, they have big, massive budgets. We have like $50 budgets that we have to work with. Um, like worldwide connections. You can go to any fabric store from Spain to India and you can get whatever you want. We live in fabric deserts. Uh, we have to work with what we can find um, and develop all of these skill sets just us um so i am i am always blown away by what other cosplayers are able to create and um and it's i've, I've seen um interviews with with like um costume studio folks and they're like the, the thing is that cosplayers are doing is basically equivalent to like an internship but at an art school like they're doing everything um and wouldn't it be cool if we just had one job where we only cut it or only died but no we have to do it all we have to figure out how to do all of this stuff from youtube and our friends and social media um so finding screen accurate fabric screen accurate is a term that gets thrown around a lot in the cosplay community because it's like how close can i get to the costume that's being created by a marvel studio thing or a house of the dragon thing how close can i get to looking like that thing um not everybody goes for accuracy not everybody has to um for me uh, if i'm recreating something from a movie i like to strive to get as close as i can to like wow that really looks like it just stepped off of the screen but that's very expensive. <laughs> they have, these movie studios have access to so much more stuff than we do. So at what at what is the closest I can get um, with the skill set that I have? So I can't know more than I already know currently. So how close can I get with what I know how to do now? Um, the resources that I have. So like, do I know how this was made? Can I find reference pictures? Casey was talking about that. Finding reference pictures can be really difficult to find sometimes for some of these costumes. Um, what kind of space do I have? Like I'm fortunate enough to be in my sewing room today, but most folks are, are sewing on their coffee tables uh, with hand-me-down sewing machines. Um, and then what kind of fabric can I afford? Um, so can we afford just thrifted stuff? Can we afford something a little more pricey that we can get shipped uh, from another country or something if we can find what was actually used in the studios, which is a, a big challenge unto itself. Um, so uh, I live in North Carolina, and so we have a big furniture industry here. And so we have a lot of remnant stores for um, upholstery fabric, which is like this thick and is really hard to use for apparel. So we go to all the all the different like uh, cast off stores to try to find remnants of stuff. And it's all so thick and you can't use it for apparel. And so we just have to work with what we've got sometimes. And so I wanted to show a couple of examples of the work I do. So um, one costume I did was Elrond from the uh, Rings of Power show on Amazon. Um, he's got this really pretty silver tunic that's got this beautiful kind of like wave or like wood grain pattern on it. And we're pretty sure that it was a custom design. Uh, studios will often have like custom made, custom dyed, dyed 14 different times in 14 different colors to like weather it and age it and everything. Um, we can't do that. Um, we don't always have the resources to be able to do that. So what I did is uh, a friend and I cut out a stencil. Uh, we freehanded the design on the front of his tunic and cut out a great big stencil for uh, what the best approximation that we could get to the, that wavy material and then uh, held that up against a um, uh, the, the gray kind of fabric that I got. You can see the very subtle waves and we just use an airbrush. So that was a way that we tried to get close to screen accuracy um, because, you know, you just gotta work with what you got. And I think it came out pretty well. Um, Doctor Strange is one of my, my big ones. Uh, I, I'm, I love cosplaying Doctor Strange, uh, his, several different iterations of his costumes. His costume's insane. Uh, there's like no straight lines on it. It's all this crazy texture. It's all this crazy stuff. And like until like right now in Charlotte, there's a, a traveling Marvel exhibit that actually has Doctor Strange's costume on display. And I freaked out when I saw it. It's like, it was incredible. Um, but until you can really see it in person, you don't really know exactly how they went about making all this stuff. I thought it was velvet embossing that was on um, those little darker patches with all the teeny little X's all over it. It is not, it is layered. Um, it's like a, a laser cut or, or something, um, a strip that's layered on top of that other red fabric. So I made it wrong I mean, and I didn't know how to make it in 2018 um but that's my my costume there in the middle um trying the best I could to recreate the um the tunic was remnants again um lots of remnant stores in Charlotte so working with what I've got so this was all remnant linen 
Um, it was probably two like great big squares of linen um, that had stains on it. Um, I think we got each piece for $6 from the store. And so um, just try to get as big a piece as I can, tried to hide where the stain was. I don't think you can see it anywhere on here. Um, and just taking as many reference pictures as I could possibly find. Um, there weren't all of that many in 2016 when the movie came out, but when I made the costume in 2018, um, there was a lot more to see, fortunately. Um, so just taking each detail, one thing at a time, just taking the um, the, the collar, um, the thing across, the embroidery across the chest, the pleats, uh, the, the cloak was it, its own beast entirely. I'm trying to pattern that out over and over again. And, real, and again, using what I had. Um, so going to an upholstery store, and finding like, okay, well, this red is like as close as I can get to the weave of that. And I'm I'm not going to be able to afford anything that's just what these movie studios are able to afford. I've got to work with what I've got. Um, so we get as close as we can. We do the best that we can with what we've got and um, really make cool stuff. Um, Merlin and Mim is my, one of my, me and Haley's favorites to do. Um, of course, it's a uh, cartoon, so we really got to have fun with it and do whatever we wanted to. Um, Mim kind of transforms into this beautiful, like, siren creature, so we wanted to do, like, a Dior-style dress for Haley, and then, like, the purple wig with her purple hair, and then um, on her dress, there's, um, we, uh, or Haley, actually, um, hand-embroidered all of the animals that Mim in the, the Disney movie, the, the Sword in the Stone, um, transforms into so it's it's embroidery to kind of incorporate all her animal transformations um her dress was very tied to the ground so we took some appliques and um sewed it to the outside of the the skirt to kind of be like vines because she lives in a swamp and she's all grumpy and, and swampy out there and in, in the woods um and then merlin we really wanted him to be more associated with the stars we wanted him to be very lofty uh very uh, intellectual and philosophical and so for his um we uh, Haley again i say we Haley did all the embroidery. Haley did all of the um, animal, all of um, Merlin's animal transformations as constellations. Um, and so we see like the mouse and I think we can see the crab uh, on there. And then I hand embroidered all of the little stars, uh, little beads all over the, the kind of the chest on the inside of the sleeves. Um, so again, that was a lot of fun. This is all upholstery fabric. Again, mine is all upholstery velvet. Um, the trim at the bottom is upholstery velvet. Again, I told you, North Carolina, we're a, a fabric desert out here, unless it's upholstery. Um, and then Haley's is all satin. Uh, we partnered with uh, Shannon Fabrics, and uh, Shannon Fabrics provided that. So that's really cool that we could do that. Otherwise, we would have had to figure out something for ourselves. Um, then when it comes to custom fabrics, again, I said the Lord of the Rings fabric, that was probably all custom made and custom created and everything. Mary Poppins uh, from Mary Poppins Returns, this red suit was custom wove. Uh, it was wove in studio. It only exists from the studio. It doesn't exist anywhere else. You can't find it in some fabric shop in London. They custom made it for this movie. Therefore, you cannot buy it. Um, so what we had to do is research, research, research and find the closest thing we possibly could, which was this zigzag fabric that you can see on the left. Unfortunately, it was a knit. <laughs> um, so for the knit to make a suit out of that, was a huge challenge uh, because of all the stretch and everything. There's a lot of interfacing. There's a lot of lining that went into this to try to make a stretch knit into something that could resemble a very structured uh, and tailored suit. Um, and so you can see from the picture there in the middle, I think we did a pretty good job. Haley, it looks amazing. Um, again, another example of uh, use the, we, using the best with what we've got, uh, what the internet is available to us and uh, what we have access to and what we can afford. Um, another costume that we have a lot of fun making was Nori Brandyfoot from the Rings of Power show on Amazon Prime. Um, this was a really big thif uh, thrifted one. Um, really like, like Janelle, we really like finding like thrifted materials so that we can uh, adapt and change and upgrade them in, in different and unique ways. And so the top is just a, a top from Goodwill. Um, it's just kind of a, um, just a Jennifer Lopez <laughs> top uh, that's that we weathered um, using spray paint um, and then also just dirt. We just rolled it around in the dirt. Um, Haley added some embroidery um, that Nori has on her costume. We cut it off at the bottom so that it would have kind of a raw edge. And then for the skirt, it was a, um, a quilt 
that we got at Goodwill that we, again, we dirtied it up. We took spray paint and um, dirtied it up outside on the porch. And then the inside was just fabric that we had in our hoard, kind of a green uh, woven fabric. And again, we just um, dirtied it up, uh, rolled it around in the dirt outside, spray painted it a lot um, just to get it really super weathered and dirty. So it really, I think we did a pretty good job. It looks a lot like the one in the movie, um, but you know, we didn't have to spend hundreds of dollars to be able to do that. We just took with what we had and I made something um, I think is looks pretty cool. Um, so yeah, that's a couple of examples of, of the work I do. Um, pop this QR code on here. If you're looking on it on your phone, then you can't scan it, uh, but you can point your camera app at this and pull up a QR code, which will lead to my Instagram. Um, that's really where I'm most active. And, um, and like Janelle and like Casey, um, I, I really take a lot of pride and passion in education. So I share as much of the process of every build that I can trying to pull back the illusion, like, oh, this just sprang into being. Like, no, it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> and like I, everyone on this call, if you're into quilting or into costuming or whatever, we all know that we work really hard. And seeing the finished products, we can often forget just how much work and how much skill goes into stuff. So um, I wanna share that. And uh, thank you all so much for uh, inviting us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much. Oh, that was wonderful. Um, Michelle is going to be um, moderating the questions. Um, so if you will all come back on, Janelle, you too, then um, we can start uh, sharing some of the questions that came in through the Q&A box. If you have a question that pops into your head, add it into the list and we'll try to get to it before the end of the hour. Um, well. Uh, I'm sure everyone that has been watching and that will watch in the future is uh, pretty much just blown away at all of your um, skills and your techniques for your costumes and your accessories. I mean, I know what you all do. I follow you a lot and I know what you make, but I just have to say seeing how you do it has just been, um, I mean, I have goosebumps just watching what you do. I think you're all amazing. And thank you so much for sharing what you do with everybody. So let's get to some questions. There's a few that I, I that are similar. So um, a couple of people were wondering, do you have to pay royalties um, for the creators of uh, characters like from Tim Burton? No. 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 Never had to deal with that. No, no we're free okay. advertisement for most of these companies. Okay. So yeah. yeah. If you, if you go see like any social media, they post from Marvel or Disney, mm -hmm. it's, it's like 80% cosplayers at various okay. events. They yeah. love us. <laughs> so they all share their, their social media. They're all sharing what you all do, which mm -hmm. is amazing, which that's the way it should be. <laughs> so, um, it says one, uh, so Julie writes, do you make costumes that are just for photos as opposed to costumes you intend to wear to cons? Which I think you sum, sum that up, but does someone just want to talk about that? Are there two different types of costumes that you that you make? Uh, well, personally, I always have an event in mind that I want to wear mine to. Mm -hmm. And there are certain costumes that I know from the get-go that I will only be able to wear for a few like maybe okay. an hour or two before it becomes too hot or uncomfortable. And there's some that I make specifically that I will be able to wear all day. Yeah. Um, but for me, like most of my motivation comes from wearing it to conventions and with other people. That's how we all met. So yeah, conventions yeah. Are, are amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Conventions. And, and I wanted to follow up on that. Um, Casey had mentioned in her uh, presentation that one of the things that's different about cosplay is that a lot of the sharing, a lot of the performance actually occurs on social media. Mm -hmm. So um, can you talk a little bit about how social media and the cons sort of play back and forth for you? Absolutely. So basically, um, we reach a larger audience by sharing on social media. That means that we're able to educate more people. We're able to help more people make the same thing that we want to make. Most of us have no other people that have made the same costumes as us. And so for us, it's more beneficial to share our process and to kind of document it. I know for me, I started documenting it because I'm a comp I, competition was the reason I started documenting. But then as social media 
media started becoming such an integral part, especially in 2020, um, I realized that my documentation process and my sharing process actually is a huge part of helping the community. And so I leaned into that aspect. And that's kind of a lot of where my stuff comes from is I like to make what I consider like a multidimensional piece. I want it to look amazing on stage. I want it to photograph amazing and I want it to move really well. That is, those are the things that are really important to me. And so if it doesn't photograph well, I have to readjust. Or if it doesn't look good on a stage with stage lighting, again, readjust. Um, and that's just me. Those are the rules that I put on myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, social media is great. It, I mean, uh, probably a lot of makers can relate to it's it's rather an isolating thing at times. Uh, we're just hunched over the sewing machines, pushing through things all day long. Um, and so we're just kind of in these craft rooms alone, but like holding up your phone and taking little five second videos and clipping them all together. Like, here's what I'm doing. And people say, oh, that's so cool. That's amazing. Oh, I learned something from you today. It's like we're uh, people like I was just at uh, San Diego Comic Con um, to judge the Her Universe Fashion Show this year. And so many people kindly came up to me and said, like, I like I loved following the creation of this, uh, the, the the outfit I was wearing. Um, and that, you know, that makes me really happy um, because, oh, people do care. I'm not just in this room all, all sad and alone, but uh, uh, working away at things. Uh, people really it, it's it's all connection. And that's that's, mm -hmm. I think, the best part of all of this. Do you have anything to add, Janelle? Um, I agree with both of them. I think I, I started in 2018 and I just kind of lightly got into it. And then 2020 is when I think I really put my whole heart into it because I channel my um, discomfort by being productive. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I was able to channel all of my discomfort throughout that um, into being productive with the cosplay. And it was just fun to share my process with friends and people who I haven't met yet. And it just gave me something to look forward to when that whole thing was over, so. Social media is very right. useful. A lot of people were asking, how do you store your pieces, your costumes, and your accessories? <laughs> so um, <laughs> you're all you're all very prolific in your costume making. So um, it, it must add up. Do you have to like farm them out or do you have a spot for them? Oh, there they are. <laughs> there they are. They're just in here. <laughs> or hanging in a closet. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw in the background, I think it was it was yours, Casey, um, a lot of wig stands. Oh yeah. All your yeah. wigs. Yeah. There they That's are. <laughs> yeah, I have a, a cedar lined attic. So I have all my stuff upstairs in garment bags, but it's not insulated. So I have to take the delicate things downstairs during the summer because I'm in <laughs> South Carolina. Yeah. But oh, yes, uh, garment yes, bags yes. and just keeping it safe from bugs. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, do you, is there a particular substrate that each of you have found the most difficult to work with, either a fabric or I know some people work with craft foam and things like that? Um, knits and stretch pleather are the things oh. that give me the most issues. <laughs> Seems like Michael feels the same way about. No, I don't. I don't like working with stretch fabric. I think uh, Mary Poppins gave me some trauma. <laughs> 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 I want it to have structure. I want it to be clean. I want it to be straight. Uh, tailoring. Uh, that that's where I like to be. Uh, so I avoid stretches so much. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really like stretches. And I also don't, I, it's not that like it's hard to work with, but I don't like working with foam because it creates so much dust in such a mess. Um, I don't have a garage. So like, I have to like work outside and um, I just don't like doing it. So I, I avoid it like the plague. <laughs> Um, one of our guests was also asking a little bit about what your favorite tools are. Do you have a few tools or, that you use that are just imperative and most important? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> not to, like, not to be that. too much of a product placement, <laughs> brand investment <laughs> or anything. Um, but uh, I, I tell people constantly, iron your seams, mm -hmm. um, press your fabric. It makes a difference. And so I'm popping from my uh, sewing machine to my ironing board mm -hmm. constantly. I, I might use this even more than my sewing machine, honestly. You know what's really interesting about that is that, um, oh, your hand. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is very useful. <laughs> um, 
-hmm. and, and for those of those, oh, you got the same one. So Casey Renee probably has one too. So the thing is, is that many of the things that you use, and as Michael said, you know, just like, um, you know, Mimi G, who's a garment, big garment sewist, you know, you, you sew a seam, you press a seam, and that's what quilters say. So mm -hmm. you all have that in common, which I think is like so interesting. So I feel like we all can um, relate to each other in the uh, skills and techniques and, and the notions and products that we have to use. And, and Janelle, you know, sort of behind her, you can see her sewing machine and her dress. <laughs> and so it very much is a familiar space. Is, oh, there you go, Michael's dress. Yep. And cool. <laughs> um, yep, that's it's a me. familiar space, but you're creating something really wonderful. Michelle, you said you had a special treat Oh. For something you wanted to share, and we're getting towards the end of the hour. Okay, so, so like, um, last year I made a flower gown for H and H America, which is a trade show, um, and my niece modeled it. But I wanted to make a headpiece to go with it, and I made it. But the hard part, which I think I should have called all three of you, was how do I get it to stay on my model's head? So it is um, formed silk flowers with um, heat and bond and the Aliso iron. And then it trails up into the air with these embroidered butterflies and you wear it on your head like this, right? So, but the thing is, it was really difficult for her to keep it on her head. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it wasn't, I had so much fun creating the piece, the head piece, mm -hmm. but um, my difficulty was, you know, my lack of experience of how to get it to, um, you know, really be part of the costume and getting it to stay on and be comfortable. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Janelle's got her hat. Yeah. <laughs> so Go ahead, Janelle. Hat I made. Oh, I love it. Like sits like that. So it's not actually hanging on very much, uh -huh. but one of my favorite things to add to accessories like this are these little snap clips. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That will actually attach to your hair and they're very, very secure. Um, you can hear it kind of snap and unsnap, but attach that to your head. And it stays I, on. I love it's like being a detective and, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> looking for the right products to use and notions and oh. just figuring it out. So well, um, we're, at the, we're at the end. Oh, we yes, we are. Okay. I can keep talking forever. I want to live in the world's that you create, they're just wonderful. And I love that the art you're making is art that, that you can then live in because I think that's just a wonderful concept. Thank you all so much, Michelle. Thank you for um, putting this panel together and sponsoring Textile Talks. Really appreciate Elisa's support. If you in the audience enjoyed today's Textile Talk, please do consider making a donation. Putting on the Textile Talks program costs a little over $50,000, and so we really depend on your support and the support of our sponsors like Oliso. Um, next week, be sure to join us. We're going to be doing the Surface Design Association's Journal Summer Party about knit and crochet in art. And the week after that, Sakwa will be back again with a deep dive into what's behind the art in our upcoming benefit auction. Thank you all for being here. This was just an amazing program. Thank you. Thank you guys. <laughs>